welcome to the University of Nottingham PGCI webinar. My name is Helen Spiropoulos and I'm the Admissions Manager at Stafford Global. But joining me this evening all the way from the University of Nottingham is Dr. Rupert. Good evening to you, Dr. Rupert. Good evening, Helen, and um, hi to everyone out there. Okay, so how we are going to conduct uh, the webinar this evening is I'm going to introduce um, Stafford just very briefly, what we actually do. I'm then going to hand you over to Dr. Rupert, who's going to go through the program um, and explain the details, um, um, academic details about the program. And towards the end of the presentation, you will have the opportunity to type out any questions that you'd like to ask Dr. Rupert or myself. What I will be doing, though, is I will be grouping the questions together because a lot of them are uh, very similar, if not identical. So do listen out uh, for, for the answer to, to those questions. Okay, so let us just get started. And who is Stafford? Uh, what do we do? Now, the mere fact that you're actually with us here this evening means that you have been in touch with one of our experienced academic consultants. And we were established in uh, 1993, and we are a resource center for distance learning education in the Middle East. And uh, we are currently the resource center for five UK universities, one of which is uh, the University of Nottingham. Now, we do offer a variety of programs, ranging from certificates to diplomas, bachelors, MBAs, MSCs, right through until doctorates. So we really do have all the programs for your personal and your professional needs. Now, our function here is to assist you throughout the recruitment process um, and uh, obviously ensure that we get that very important unconditional offer for you. And we do also offer academic as well as administrative support. Okay, so I'm now going to hand you over to Dr. Rupert and I'll join you again towards the end of the webinar. Over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Helen. Um, okay, everybody, so I'm going to tell you a bit about the University of Nottingham um, and the School of Education, just to give you a sense of, of uh, the institution that you may be studying with. Then I'm going to talk about the PGCI course in terms of its structure and the way we work and what to expect and finally get into some of the details about uh, how to apply and the kind of things we're looking for. And as Helen said, uh, there's an opportunity at the end for questions and Helen will help by gathering similar themes together and putting them out there and hopefully I can help or Helen can help uh, and if not we'll, we'll find out the answer for you. So I hope that's going to be a useful uh, process to go through. So uh, to start off with the University of Nottingham, um, the university is, is a well-known UK university, part of the uh, prestigious Rus Russell Group of universities. As you can see here from the slide, it has a very high ranking internationally, um, as well as being in the UK. Um, so the name itself is uh, quite a powerful, um, well-respected name in the university field. It's very much a global university. We've got campuses in China and Malaysia, as well as here in Nottingham. And we have um, a great many international students working with us across all of those campuses, including here. It's a university that's well known for research and some of the people who have helped create the course that we're talking about today are people really at the forefront of their field. But it's also a university that's got a great reputation for uh, teaching quality. So um, in the UK at the moment, there are uh, sort of badges of, of accreditation and the University of Nottingham has a gold award for its teaching quality. And it's also, as you can see here, got this Sunday Times uh, International University of the Year Award. More specifically within that, the School of Education is one of the oldest in the country, um, well over 100 years old in, in one form or another. And we've been working with uh, student teachers, but also practicing teachers for all of those years in, in many, many ways. And uh, it's, it, the School of Education is a real center of excellence in this particular discipline. Um, so, for example, in terms of research in education, uh, in the most recent rankings, the University of Nottingham's department was ranked third, and we are eighth in the UK for education as a subject. 
So we've got a lot of expertise in this area specifically, as well as the general reputation of the university. So that gives you a little bit of background about who we are and where you might be studying. So looking more specifically at the PGCI course, this stands for the Postgraduate Certificate in Education International. And it's a course at master's level, postgraduate level course. Um, and it's for specifically designed for educators working outside the UK. So it's got a really distinctive international flavor to it. The course has just been uh, revamped. So every, uh, every few years or every several years, we, uh, we look at the course and we, we renew the materials and all of the things that are or the components that you'll meet on the course. That's just been done. So as of the last month or so, um, cohorts are now working on a new version of the course. So this is a really exciting time to become part of this. It's what we call um, a blended learning program. So that means that it involves some face-to-face -face teaching and it involves some teaching um, or some learning at a distance that you can do online. I'll come back to that in just a moment. I think the other thing that's really important first is to establish that the course um, is an academic program of study. So it's a master's level qualification in, in educational theory. Although it's going to have impact on practice, it's going to be uh, giving you some really useful principles as an educator that will underpin your practice, ideas that can inform what you do in your educational setting. It's got to be stressed that it's not a course that offers you qualified teacher status. So QTS is a well-known um, qualified teacher um, award that is specific to the UK. It's, it's not offering you that. Um, and equally, we're not making a claim to offer a license to teach. So in different regions and different, different countries, there'll be various requirements for what constitutes a qualified teacher. So if this is um, something that you're hoping will move your career on and enable you to become a teacher, um, it may well do that. It may well enhance your career in that sense. But you need to check very carefully uh, wherever you're intending to work for the exact requirements, because this in itself is, is not uh, constituting a license to teach. What it is doing though is giving you a course of uh, professional enrichment that is going to really um, boost and inform your practice. I often say at these points that when I was a teacher in school myself, because that, that was my background originally, I undertook a master's level study while I was working as a teacher, did it in my, my spare time as probably you would on this course, and it really really relaunched everything I was doing in school. It made me look again at ideas, it made me rethink things, it gave me new perspectives. So it's something that I know had a huge impact on my practice and was really, really worthwhile. And I'm sure the same would be true of you. So I talked about this being blended in the sense that there is face-to-face -face tuition as well as some online learning. So the face-to-face -face, um, teaching occurs through two workshops in the year one right at the start and one about halfway through the course. These workshops for this particular cohort take place in the UAE. Um, it's worth saying, by the way, we have cohorts all over the world. This is a course that's been running for something like 11 or so years. Um, 2,000 or so students have come through this course all around the globe. But the cohort we're talking about today meets in the UAE. So we would be um, having a, a workshop over, over a weekend at the start of the course and one about halfway through the course. So that gives you lots of opportunities. It gives you the opportunity to meet your tutor. So for example, I'm going to be coming out in about um, just over a week's time, in fact, with a team of four colleagues. So five of us will be coming out to the UAE to do a workshop over a weekend. So I'll be meeting my students at that point. So you get to meet your tutor face to face, the person that's going to be seeing you through the course and, and uh, getting to know you. That's really valuable. So you, you, can, uh, you can have met and really know each other quite well. It's also an opportunity to be inducted into the course. So we can go through course materials and all sorts of the big ideas that you're going to encounter in the modules. But the other part that perhaps people wouldn't bargain on quite as much, but is really beneficial, is you're going to meet a whole host of other educators. So a typical cohort in this region is, is close to 100 at a time. 
And we, although we put you into smaller groups for some of the work, uh, typically a group of, of 20 maximum, uh, you will actually be there with all of those educators. And it's a great chance for networking. It's a great chance for meeting people who are working in different countries, who come from different countries, people working in different school systems. So they could be working in British curriculum schools, um, American curriculum schools, SABIS schools, international baccalaureate schools. So in terms of broadening your horizons and learning about education, even within your, your region of the world, um, from a whole range of perspectives, it's a really valuable thing to do. So your peers on the course will be really important. And we build in lots of opportunity in those taught workshops for you to collaborate and, and get to know each other. So we have those two workshops in the year, beginning and middle, and then we have a comprehensive set of materials that you can work through um, during the year. So let's look a bit more at how this is structured. So the PGCI is um, split into three modules. These are compulsory modules of 20 credits each, so you're getting 60 credits by the end. But we, we talk about a bit, this being a blended course in an, a second way as well, which is that actually every individual learner, every, every student on the course makes their own blend of the course. Because although the modules are compulsory, the, the materials and the, the units within the module that you select offer you some chance for choice and personalization. And the way that you work on the assignments can also be tailored to your setting. So whether you are an early years teacher in, in a kindergarten class or you're a secondary school maths teacher or whoever, whoever you are and whoever you're working with, perhaps you're a teaching assistant, maybe you're a class teacher, whatever your whatever your setting whatever your role you can tailor the materials that you choose and the assignments that you produce to your particular um, your role as an educator so the course is very um, personalizable in that sense so you cover these three modules and they represent a kind of journey which i think has a real coherence and a sense of um, purpose to it so the first module is about educational aims and values, specifically set in an international context. So we look a lot at what international education is all about and what that means and the different interpretations of that. And we're really asking a question in module one about what education is for. Is it, for example, all about educating people to get the highest grades they can in exams? Is it about educating people to be uh, productive citizens of, of a particular society or citizens of the world? Is it about developing each person as an individual so that they can uh, fulfill their own individual potential to the maximum? There are all kinds of different uh, values and different purposes of education such as those. And uh, module one is all about exploring those different perspectives and possibilities and for you to begin to consider your own views and your own value system which maybe you haven't explicitly thought about before. So we are going to relate all some of those big ideas from the theory to a school setting or a model of education that, that you know well, perhaps the school that you work in. Having thought about what education is for and the purposes, module two then looks at the way we go about that. So we look at really two things. We look at theories of learning, lots of different perspectives on how learners um, of different ages go about their learning. And related to that, we look at different ideas about teaching. So things to do with um, behavior, things to do with uh, working with learners, with English as an additional language, with special educational needs, learning collaboratively versus individually, all sorts of themes. And as I said before, lots of chance to select different topics that are most relevant and most interesting to you. So module two is about learning and about teaching. And then module three is really partly about um, students' understanding. So if we've determined what education is for, and then we've thought about how students learn and therefore how we teach them, a logical final step is to say, how do we know that they have understood what we've taught them? So part of the final focus is about understanding in module three. But we do this through you um, conducting an inquiry of your own. So we also teach you about being a teacher researcher. 
and you'll carry out um, a small, very, very small scale inquiry project in your own setting, doing a little bit of research, gathering a little bit of data and looking at that issue of, of student understanding. So three modules equally weighted over the period of the year. Each of those modules is assessed, and it says here by a 4,000 word assignment, there is actually a choice you have in each case. You can write um, an assignment and do a written piece of work, 4,000 word piece, or in each case, there's also an option to do a presentation, which is a videoed form of presentation, and that, that varies slightly between the modules as to how that works, but that would be 4,000 words worth of work. So an equivalent to that amount of work, but done in, in presentation form where you present to the camera and perhaps uh, offer a commentary, for example, of, of some footage of your classroom, that type of thing. And we give you a lot of comprehensive guidance about that. It's quite natural, and maybe some people out there listening are thinking this, to be a little bit worried about the academic work and the assignments, and to think that you haven't worked perhaps at this level before, or to think that it's a long time since you've done any academic study, if you've been working uh, for a number of years already. But it's quite normal to be, um, to be nervous about that. We know this and we, we work with this every year. So a lot of the work that we do at particularly the first of our face-to-face -face workshops, but also through the materials that you access, is about helping you to get to grips with academic writing and academic reading. So we offer you examples of, of previous students' work, we deconstruct that together, and we think about all of the hallmarks of good work and what we're looking for in our assignments. So we'll work with you with that. And the process for each module also supports that because in each case, you're going to be submitting for, for each assignment a proposal to your tutor. So your tutor can see what you're thinking of doing and offer you some detailed feedback before you complete the actual piece of work. Additionally, for the first module, you have the option of submitting a draft, a full draft of the assignment. And we can offer again, detailed feedback on that before you submit the real assignment. So lots and lots of structure and lots of online materials to help you with that side of things. So we said that this was a 60 credit course at master's level. What that means is, as well as walking away with the, the PGCEI certificate, and maybe that being an end in itself, you also have something that you can then transfer, if you choose to, to our MA courses. So we have a really well established and a highly regarded MA in education here at Nottingham. You can study this entirely uh, flexibly and online at a distance, or you can combine that with some face-to-face -face work here in Nottingham if you choose to. But you can use your credits, um, provided you've passed at master's level, towards the MA in education. And as you can see here on the screen, that includes some specialist routes for people who might be interested in, in special needs or leadership and management or various other aspects of, of education. So if you are working towards the full MA in education, for example, you could transfer your 60 credits and that would represent a third of the MA done already. So you've effectively skipped the first third and, and already paid for the first third of, of the MA. Going back to PGCI though, um, the other thing to say about the learning process in, in the PGCI year is that there's a wealth of materials online for you to work with. So I've already mentioned the course has just been updated and uh, the materials and the readings are all um, new and revisited um, pieces of, of work for you that we're confident will really give you a fantastic journey. As well as readings that are embedded in the materials, You've also got um, audio clips and you've got video clips. So it's a really multimedia experience. You also automatically have access to the University of Nottingham Library. And most of the things that we refer you to are electronic books. So there are links embedded in the course materials as further reading. And then you also have access to searching our entire collection for even, even wider reading that you may need to do. So you don't need to be going out and buying books or having access to, um, to a library near you or spending money in that sense. Everything is built into the course and everything's included and you can access that all electronically. The third point on this slide is also really important. So 
We've talked about how you meet your tutor right near the beginning of the course and you have an actual person, a real person who you know who's seeing you through this process. That tutor is there for your whole journey, so they are your point of contact. So for my group that I'm working with right now, for example, I know that they can email me at any time, I can answer queries, I can support them. If they want to have a tutorial, we can have a tutorial either by Skype if that's available for you or if not through through the phone or some other medium and that support and that named person is always there. You've also got that support of the peer group that we talked about that was um, a strong feature of the face-to-face -face workshop because at various points during the course we ask you as part of your coursework to post um, thoughts about issues or little uh, short pieces of writing to forums online. And what that means is you can put up an idea about something you've read and then everybody else can also respond and you can get into some dialogue with people who are working across different countries and with very, very diverse perspectives. So that kind of peer discussion and peer support is also really important. So we'll turn now to um, the entry requirements. So as a postgraduate course, uh, the usual requirements would be to have a bachelor's degree. And you can see here, usually at least second class uh, degree. Um, there's an English language requirement as well, which you can see on the screen there. Um, because this is a master's level course and it's, it's studied in English, it's really important that you come into it with um, that sort of confident level. And you've, you've got the IELTS figures there that, that uh, indicate the required level there. It's worth saying though, um, as the second point on this slide, is that if you sit somewhat outside that profile I've just mentioned, um, and you have what we might call a non-standard profile, um, it's still worth talking to your academic consultant at Stafford and, and, and applying if you have something that we could regard as equivalent to that background. So if you have equivalent professional qualifications, maybe based on a long time working as an educator or other things that you feel uh, would, would stand in, instead of those kind of uh, basic requirements I've mentioned. So if you do feel that your case is a little different, but you, you've got a strong case and you're confident academically, do talk to your consultant and uh, it may be something that we can have a look at. What is important though, um, the first point on this slide though, is that you are what we call an established educator. So what does that mean? Uh, well, it could mean all sorts of things. We, we need you to be someone who has regular access to a classroom. So uh, you might be a teaching assistant or learning support assistant. You might be a teacher. You might be somebody else in a school, or such as um, a school librarian or a school leader, or you may have some other um, educational role. You could even be uh, somebody volunteering in a school as long as you have access to classrooms. And the reason for that is because a lot of the work that we get you to do is relating the theory of education and all the ideas we're talking about to a specific setting. And in your assignments, you're going to be required to make those kind of connections. So you need to have an educational context that you're familiar with and that you can write about. So that's really, really important. It also, I should just flip back for a second, uh, it's also important, of course, probably goes without saying, to have access to, uh, to the internet because of all that online material that you're going to need to work through. So application um, requirements are here and uh, you can talk to your Stafford consultants again if you're not sure about these kind of things. Important things that we tend to pick out here are the, the personal statement. So it's important um, to, to try and demonstrate in that statement what your motivation is for this course. What are you trying to get from this? What educational uh, background do you have in terms of you as an educator? So how does this fit with your professional profile and your experience? And also what about those transferable skills? Quite often we have people on the courses, um, on this PGCI course, who have had a career in some other field. People have worked in, in law or marketing or, so, or some other whole uh, profession, but they've got an awful um, lot of transferable skills they can bring across. The other thing to think about is the second point here about the reference. So try and pick a referee who can say something about you as a professional perhaps, but also somebody who can be convincing about your readiness for academic study. 
So uh, things like working to deadlines and being organized um, and being able to be, uh, to, to be, to be ready to, to work at that sort of high academic level that we're going to need for, for a master's level course. So the, um, the next course, well, in fact, it's, it's uh, quite a big day, the 1st of October today, because um, the, the, there's a cohort starting, in fact, today, as we speak, the 1st of October, and I'll be going out to do the first workshop with them in just over a week's time. That cohort, of course, is closed now. But the good news is we have two cohorts starting every year. So the next cohort isn't a year's time, but it's actually beginning in March. So if you're um, in a position to apply at the moment or shortly, then we'd be looking at a start in March. So program starting on the 1st of March. With all of our cohorts, because of staffing levels and wanting to keep that ratio and that kind of quality, we have a strict limit on numbers. So it's really worth um, applying as soon as possible, even though March sounds like it's a long way off. It's worth applying as soon as possible for that cohort and making sure that you get a place. The face to face workshops for that next cohort, the first one will be um, 6th and 7th of March. As I said before, we do these over a weekend so that you don't have to come out of work. And we know that would be very difficult for lots of people. So we don't require you to, to have to take any time away from your, your job or your workplace. And then the second workshop for this next cohort would be in early October. And we're just finalizing the dates there. So at that point, we've been through lots of information. Um, I hope that's useful and gives you a sense of the course already, but there's probably going to be questions that you have or perhaps things that you want some elaboration on. So please do ask those questions and with, with Helen's help, we'll see if we can answer them. Okay, super. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rupert. Okay, so I can see a few questions have come through already and um, Irfana's question is about um, IELTS. Um, Irfana has actually done an IELTS general. Will that be accepted um, going forward? So we, we need an academic IELTS. Um, so again, that's the sort of thing that would be good to talk to your, your staff and consultants about, and they can advise you with their experience. Um, but really we're looking for that academic um, IELTS qualification. Okay, and John has got an interesting question, but if, if I wanted, could I attend lectures in the actual university? I do understand that um, I would perhaps need to, to do all the workshops here um, in the UAE, um, but if I was traveling, could I actually join one of the cohorts in the UK? Well, it would be great to have anybody come and see us in the UK anytime here in Nottingham, although it's a very cold, rainy day, I have to warn you right now. Um, but in terms of, of this cohort, the, the, all of the teaching would be those workshops in the UAE. Um, that we do have other cohorts. We have a European, we have several European cohorts, and one of those uh, meets every summer in Nottingham. So you do have an option, actually, to work with a, a whole different cohort and, and join our Nottingham group instead. But if you're thinking of really um, the, the cohort we're talking about today in the UAE, I think uh, two, op two things I could mention to you. Um, one is, of course, if you're ever passing in, and you're, you're in Nottingham or you're in the UK and you'd like to meet up with your tutor, I'm sure by arrangement it would be great to have you come along and, and we'd like to see you here. That wouldn't be necessarily for any formal teaching um, because that course and those lectures wouldn't be running at that time outside of the workshop. The other option is if you did continue with the MA, that gives you a chance to come to Nottingham and attend um, a face-to-face -face, uh, module or modules uh, of the MA at the university if you chose to do a face-to-face -face rather than online version. So there are ways certainly that you can you can come here and, and see us and that would be that would be great. But really the teaching for this particular course is going to be those two workshops that you have in the UAE. Okay, and can I stop my studies for a short while and then resume again? Um, what are the procedures for that? So that's a, that's a good question because we know that life happens, life gets in the way sometimes and unforeseen things crop up. So although this is normally a year's study or more like 11 months study really, um, if something unforeseen happens and you do need to pause your studies, as long as there's a, a reasonably good 
um, reason for that, um, and you can explain that to us, then we would uh, we would always want to support you, and you can take what's called a voluntary interruption of study or a viz. And what that means is we essentially just press pause on the course. You can step away for a negotiated length of time. It could be it could be um, a month. It could be a year. And then you resume the course and you pick up exactly where you left off after that. During that period of interruption, you don't have contact really with your tutor, you don't, you don't have access to the materials, you generally have walked away and just paused. But when you come back, there's no penalty, uh, you get new deadlines set and you pick up where you left off. The thing just to be aware of with anything like that is that there's a maximum registration period on this course of three years. So if you do take a very long interruption or a number of smaller ones, you must finish within three years, which is a, a non-negotiable regulation. Okay, and can I join this program without any experience in teaching? Well, if you have um, access to a classroom and you can negotiate that access um, and you, you're ready to immerse yourself in, in an educational setting now, then you probably would be eligible to join us. Um, it may be worth thinking about the timing and thinking, well, if I'm just embarking on, on a career, or I'm just about to get a job, maybe you would get more out of the course a little further down the line because what we study will then have more meaning to you. Um, but certainly we have people on the course every year who perhaps are setting out and starting out in education. So in theory, yes, that, that's possible. Okay, um, and that would also uh, cover the means question as well. Um, of volunteer teachers um, in some situations um, are fine, um, depending on the schools that you're going to apply as well. Um, but do get in touch with your academic consultant, she'll be able to give you um, a lot more information on that. Okay, um, Shazia has got an interesting question. What are the job pre uh, prospects uh, post completion of this course in your experience? Well, um, as I said in the presentation, we've got to be clear that this is not giving a license to teach or an automatic um, qualified teacher status of any kind. So it isn't opening a door in that direct and measurable way. What it is doing though, is it's, um, I think, massively enhancing your, your CV or resume as an educator. So it's very hard to quantify, and it's very difficult to say this percentage of people who've been on the course have then become a, a, a particular role in, in school. We don't really have that kind of information because it isn't something where you're, you're getting uh, a qualification that means a new job automatically. But it is something where we have testimony from students um, from every cohort really over years and years that this is something that has enabled them to move on and to, uh, to progress in their career. And again, if I go back to my experience of working at master's level when I was teaching in school, it didn't automatically give me a new job or a, an increase in salary or anything like that but it definitely boosted my career prospects. It was something I could mention to employers. And it was something that was really valued and it actually made my practice stronger. So in that sense, um, I, I was able to move on. So we have lots of, lots of really positive um, stories and testimony about how this has helped people in their careers, but it's very hard to be specific and, and put a, a figure on that or anything uh, that, that's very quantifiable. Okay, is it an option to do this program uh, within a two-year period rather than a one-year period? And how would the modules be spread out within the two-year period instead of the one? Is this viable? Well, really, it's always a one-year course that you'd be embarking on. So there isn't really a standard option to do this in two years. The exception to that would be what we talked about before, where if at some point in the course you had a good reason to interrupt your studies, then in practice, if you, for instance, had to interrupt your studies for a year, then you could, um, in theory, you could, you could have spread things over two years. And the modules in that case would really pick up from wherever you'd left off. It would depend on where you broke your study. What I would say is something to be very cautious about is, um, as well as the fact you need, a, you, know, you need a reason why you would be suspending studies or interrupting studies, is that you are part of a cohort 
and you have that peer support and you have those two workshops with your tutor and with that, that group that you're going to get to know very well. If you step out for a long period of time, you effectively are, are coming out of that, um, that process that everybody's on and, and those, de those dates and deadlines that everyone's working to. And for example, you might, um, you might miss the second workshop. You could probably pick up a second workshop with a different group, um, perhaps the following year's group, if it was an exceptional case, but you really are then out of sync with everybody else. So what I would say is it's not something to plan for. It's not something that we would um, encourage as a normal thing to do that you would spread over two years, but it's something where we can work with you if circumstances mean that you need some flexibility. Okay, um, and very important, I can see a few questions coming through with regards to teaching. And as um, Dr. Rupert has said, this is not a teaching qualification. Um, so you have to be very careful as well um, when you are um, uh, dealing with your school or you're looking for a position uh, that they will accept you with this particular program. Um, and uh, every single ministry, every single country within the Middle East has also got their own rules and regulations with regards to what they will accept um, their teachers to have, what qualifications. It's imperative that you do get in touch with local ministries and chat to your schools as well to see um, if this is the program that they will accept. So please do take that uh, in, in mind when you're actually looking for doing this program. Um, this is a question is, uh, at what age does this allow me to teach? Um, is, uh, you know, is it primary school, secondary school, is there an age that I could be teaching? So this is uh, a generic course really, so it, it's for educators working with students of all ages. Um, so we've, we've pretty much in every cohort, I think we have a spread of people working from early years, from, from even perhaps uh, students who are three years old, right up to 18 year olds. So it's really, although um, we could look at the, the term educator and that role in, a, in an even broader sense, really the materials and the content of the course are geared to what we call schooling, so formal schooling of some kind, but the whole age range is, is what we cover. So as I mentioned in the presentation, although the modules are compulsory, what you can do is select particular parts of those modules according to your interests and the age group that you work in. And you then are going to write or present your assignments in a way that reflects and talks about your particular setting. So the, the content is for all age groups, so it's not uh, focused on just primary or just secondary. Um, and I think one of the advantages of, of our face-to-face -face groups, when I talked before about the peer group that you're in and that networking, is that you're going to meet people who are not only from different school systems and different regions, but also from different age phases. And it's really interesting for people who are working in primary, for example, to sit on a table and talk about educational issues with people from a secondary school or people from maybe you know a kindergarten class. So I think that's one of the strengths of the course is that it cuts across those age phases. Ken, how much will be in contact weekly? Do I need to know um, about the, because I need to know about the amount of work um, that I, I need to dedicate to? So how much time do you suggest I spend during the week? Yeah, so this is really understandable that you'd be thinking about whether you can fit this into your, your, busy, your busy schedule. So we tend to say as a guideline, something like 12 to 14 hours a week is likely to be needed to be successful on the course. So for some people that might be spread out a little bit every evening and you just get into a habit of doing that. For other people, it might be putting aside a whole day at the weekend and having a massive chunk of time and working on things. So you can manage your time um, through each module. Each module is going to be lasting between three and four months. You're going to have deadlines within that module, usually two deadlines. One is for a piece, a, a small piece of coursework that you submit, which um, just represents how you've worked through the course materials. It doesn't involve much writing and then you have your end of module assignment. So those deadlines are fixed and, and except in exceptional cases with a formal process they're not negotiable deadlines 
other than that you work through at your own pace but that sort of amount of 12 hours to make 12 hours or so 12 to 14 a week is a reasonable way of, of looking at it and what i'd say in, in reassurance if that sounds like a lot is we get these questions every time and um, each time we have a new cohort starting people are always a little bit uh, worried about that and they they almost always find that they are able to cope and they can get through and they, they fit in more than they thought they could. Ken, and how does this course actually give you any additional advantage uh, for an ad on QTS? And uh, which countries would accept this uh, PGCE with, um, with the exception of the UK? Uh, so this goes back to that idea of, you know, whether to what extent this is a teaching qualification, really. So in terms of does it give you an advantage with QTS? Um, um, I would say no, it's a separate qualification. You are QTSs in English qualification specifically. Um, so that, that's really important to remember. So this is not giving you QTS and it doesn't, it's not a prerequisite for later getting QTS. Uh, the other part of the question was about which countries would accept this. Well, because it's not a teaching qualification, it isn't really something that is accepted or not accepted. It's um, a recognized uh, qualification at master's level from um, a, a well-renowned university. So really recognized internationally in that sense. But in terms of what doors this opens for you and, and uh, what it enables you to do, that goes back to that point about just checking locally um, and thinking about what is what is your career path and, and therefore what's required. So it's difficult to be specific about uh, those points there, but it, but it's we've got to keep in mind this is very separate from any kind of qualified teacher status. Ken, after my, my program, how many months uh, shall it take for me to complete a master's? Well, usually people that are studying master's part-time on top of work tend to do it over three years. So you've essentially done the first year. So normally you would then do um, a, a, another year where you choose two modules and you'd study the two modules in a year as a part-time student. And then a, another year, final year, where you'd spend the year doing a dissertation. So a big project of your own, building up to a, a 15,000 word study. So typically after PGCI, you would normally as a part-time student do two more years of part-time study. And we have a nice record of transition from people from PGCI onto our MA courses. Lots of the tutors from the PGCI also work on the MA. So I work on the MA myself at the moment. I'm supervising a dissertation student who's um, who started PGCI, not in this um, region, but in another region in the world, did the PGCI qualification, has done a couple of modules, and is now in his final year doing dissertation. So I'm, I'm supervising that, and I was talking to him um, through Skype just a couple of days ago about that. So we do have that kind of pathway that's recognized, and typically two more years part-time. Okay, how different is this PGCI from a typical RB curriculum program? So was that, sorry, Helen, was that, did you say IB curriculum program? RB, yes, RB curriculum program. Uh, IB? Yes. Yes. So if we're talking about international baccalaureates um, for sure. IB, yeah. So uh, this is um, this is entirely separate from, from what IB cover. So in, in IB schools, if you're working in that setting, there are various curricula that you'll know, like the, the primary years program, middle years program and diploma. So we have every year students on the course who are working in those kind of settings and those kind of schools. And what we're doing is absolutely compatible with working in that way and the way that IB do things. Equally, we have people who are working in very, very different settings that are almost the polar opposite of that kind of school ethos. So it isn't something that is tailored to or about IB in any way, but it's something that is entirely compatible with that. And I'd go back to what I said really about being able to shape the choices within modules and to shape your assignments around the kind of setting that you work in. So just as an example of that, the first module at the moment, the assignment um, is going to be asking you really to relate 
some theory about educational aims and values in an international context to a particular model of schooling. So if you were working in an IB setting, you could be talking all about that kind of philosophy and that kind of approach to education and linking it to those module one materials and writing all about your IB setting. So in that, in that way, you can definitely relate these things, but they are not um, specifically about any one system. Okay, and um, I see there's a few questions with regards to IELTS, so I'll just answer that. Um, we only accept the academic IELTS, and you must have an overall score of 6.5. Okay. However, do get in touch with your academic consultant, because the university will also accept other forms of, of English uh, assessments. Um, so do get in touch with your academic consultant on that. Okay, and... Um, Sorry, I'm just going to, there's quite a few questions that are coming through as well. If I do have a, a degree from the UK, would I really need to still do an IELTS? Um, well, again, it, it depends, but if you've, if you've um, studied in English and you've studied at a recognised institution, and I'm, I would certainly guess that a, a UK university would be on our list of recognised institutions, then you, you may be exempt from that. So again, I think if you go through your academic consultant and just check, but there may well be um, no need for you to do it in that case. Okay, um, and again, again, with regards to um, the program being recognised in your own uh, country um, or wherever you are busy uh, uh, teaching, please do get in touch with uh, your own um, education ministry. Um, simply because the rules and regulations do tend to change um, on a yearly basis, sometimes um, uh, almost on a monthly basis. So do get in touch with your local uh, ministry with regards to recognition, local recognition. Okay. All right. And... Uh, is there any possibility that um, the, the tutors can actually teach me one-on-one -on -one via Skype if I do have an issue with a particular point in my assignment or in my program? Yeah, that's certainly a possibility. So um, by, by arrangement, by appointment, you can arrange for a tutorial with your, with your tutor and we can do that via Skype if you have access to Skype. So um, yes, that's certainly the kind of thing. And if somebody is struggling, um, has had a problem with an assignment or something that's, that's a bit of a, a block in any way, that would often be the kind of time that we would do that. So we don't have a requirement that's built in for you to have a certain number of tutorials through the year. That's really up to you. Um, many people don't feel the need to do that. But if you do, that's one of the roles that your tutor will have, yeah. Okay. Um, and Shazia, it's very important, as Dr. Rupert has said, is to have access to a school environment um, to be able to do this program. Um, do get in touch with your academic consultants who can give you a little bit more information um, on that and, and what the requirements are for entry for the, for the program. Okay. Um, okay. And uh, my school... Um, would actually require me um, to, oh, this is interesting, my school would actually require me to have a face-to-face -face, um, tutoring for, or I don't think she means tutoring, I think it's probably assessment, uh, classroom assessment. Uh, is this part of your program or can I request this specifically from a tutor? Uh, unfortunately, this, this is not part of our program, um, so we don't offer any assessment of your practice in the classroom. Um, sometimes we have students who just informally alongside studying the PDCI, they, they want to initiate something in their own school and somebody informally mentors them during that period and gives them feedback and so on. But that's definitely not built into this course. And um, so it's not, it's not a feature of what we're doing. And if that's something your school requires, then probably this isn't the right thing for you. Okay, and uh, Malik, with regards to the list that Dr. Rupert was uh, talking about, a list of um, 
uh, the, con the institutions that are recognized by the university, the only way that that can be assessed is to submit an entire application that will then get sent through to the admissions department uh, at the university. Okay, so unfortunately, Dr. Rupert does not have that list at hand. That gets handled directly by the admissions. So do send your application in as soon as possible and we can actually get uh, some feedback from the university on that. Um, if I can't attend the workshop, uh, what would your suggestion be? Um, I have been told that they are mandatory, um, but if there are circumstances beyond my control, um, is there any way that I can shift this or I can make up what is covered in the workshop? So the, the workshops are mandatory and it's, it's definitely a very formal requirement of the course um, it built into the regulations of the course now that you must attend um, and there's good reason for that because what we cover is really going to be very is going to be essential for your success I, I would say because there's so much information that we give you it's very difficult to catch up on your own or to uh, to work around those things if um, you were unable to come to the first workshop we would definitely be asking you to defer to the next cohort which would only be about six months along the line. If you've begun the course already and you've come to the first workshop and then something really, really unforeseen and, and unavoidable happened that meant you couldn't come to the second one, what you'd have to do is go through a process now. Um, it's, there's a fairly new process where you have to uh, complete um, a form online and submit some evidence to show the reason for not being able to attend. That would then get assessed, and if um, if it's judged to be a valid reason, and therefore an exemption could be granted, then um, that might that may happen, uh, because of course we understand that there may be some really exceptional things that do crop up, and we're not seeking to be awkward about that. Um, but you would have to go through that official process, and you would have to have some evidence, and for that to be very clear that it was something that that couldn't be foreseen. Okay, and uh, a last question is how many times can I actually fail an assignment? Okay, um, some positive thinking there. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, well, you, you, we, we understand that um, studying at this level is new for people. So there is always the option where if, if you've submitted your assignment on time and it hasn't come up to the required level, you do have an opportunity to resubmit in each case. What happens then is that you're not just cut loose and told to just to do it again. You would definitely then be offered a tutorial with your tutor. You would already have some really detailed feedback from the tutor about exactly what you needed to do to put this right. So you wouldn't be starting all over again in all likelihood. You'd be amending your first go at this. You'd have very clear guidance and you'd have tutorial support to do that. So the standard procedure that it, gets complicated sometimes depending on the mark that you achieve first time round. But pretty much what I can say is a standard thing is you would certainly have another chance to resubmit that assignment in each case. So uh, you don't necessarily have to get there first time round. Good, excellent. Okay, so I have managed to group all the questions together. Um, quite interesting questions. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. It was lovely having you with us. And again, it was excellent having you with us again, Dr. Rupert. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to see all of you at our very next um, uh, cohort. As Dr. Rupert has said, um, there's limited seats available per cohort. So I really do advise that you send that application to your consultant as soon as possible so we can get that all-important unconditional offer for you. Yeah. Thanks again Dr Rupert. Okay thank you Helen and thanks everyone for um, for coming along to the webinar like this just virtually coming along anyway and be great to see you um, in one of our cohorts um, as soon as possible so so good luck thank you. Yeah, thank you good evening everyone. <laughs>